April the 2nd, 2015. This is CISG 113, Section 1, Information Security and Privacy. Today is day number 22 in the week number 11. So let's get started. First of all, welcome back to this class. Um, let me switch off the front row lights first. Okay, um, this is week number 11. If you look at this week, you will understand that we have actually stepped out of learning contract number 3, although we have given you an extensive week to collect your work by the end of this weekend. Okay, uh, you will see that the deadline is still the 28th, but you can always submit the work before the end of this weekend, that means April the 4th. Uh, you will not be counted as late because we would like to stick to the original schedule. Now, um, if you look at this week, all right, um, we have four weeks left in the semester. And according to the syllabus, if you look at the remaining four weeks, the theme is called IL, Integrative Learning. Now, what does it mean by IL? And of course, what is required of you in the remaining four weeks is do something called a learning portfolio. Okay, it's not going to be difficult. Okay, it's just a kind of exercise you need to go through. Now, let me explain to you the meaning of IL. Integrative learning is a very important um, paradigm to enable our students to learn, particularly in college, because in the past. Normally, we just require students to complete some coursework and then we will just let them go, give them a grade. Now, I would not say that I'm not going to let you go, I will let you go. But I want to give you some ideas of how you can connect the knowledge you obtain from individual courses together. And the reasons why this is important is because when you go to work today, when people ask you for resume, they're looking for proofs of how mature you have been as a student to integrate learning together. Particularly, when they ask you a very simple questions, could you share with us some experience you've gone through in a specific area? And that is when you have to go back to your IL records and show them something of your work. Okay, and it is often related to the portfolio concept because nowadays when people ask you for something such as a credential, they're actually looking for clues of your practical experience or your work done in the past. And they would not be interested to just look at your transcripts, grade A or B or C. Actually, the grade is not a big problem in looking for a job. What they're looking for is some kind of concrete experience you've gone through. For example, if you have a piece of homework, you did it, and you did it with collaborations with your partner, and you did it with discussions, you did it with some research work such as inquiry-based learning, or you did write a blog to express your personal will. So you can see that what we're going to do in IL is to make sure you understand it's important that this is your responsibility, actually not part of the requirements of this course, but I actually put them there because in this course we do not have final exam. Instead, in the remaining four weeks, we would like to, we would like to encourage you to use what you have done in the first 10 weeks of the semester to try to construct your personal learning portfolio as an important evidence of your integrative learning, okay? Now this is something uh, important. Now in the past semester, I do have a set of criteria for students to use to do that. But in this semester, because we do have many students, I would not say that you must do this, you must do this, or you must include this, or you must include that. Rather, I'm going to give you a guideline, starting from this week, that what is important in integrative learning in every course you're going to do, and in this particular course, which is called Information Security and Privacy, is that you need to identify, first identify, some topics of interest which you believe 
are important in this course. Okay? First of all, identify some topics of interest which you believe are important in this course. Now, I would say that because this course is not a very technical course, we cannot afford to do it. Okay? You know, in, in a sense that we do not have sophisticated computer in front of you, you can, you can try the software there and you can create some kind of malware there and you can attack some kind of computer and steal someone's privacy. No, we do not want you to do something like that. All of it is not difficult to do that. But once you've done that, your computer might be identified as, a, as something dangerous. No, we would not say you're going to do something like this, all right? But we would like you to identify some topics of interest which you have actually gone through in the first 10 weeks using, number one, the resources on this website, because on each week, divided into two days, on each day, you can see we have a large number of resources there, such as YouTube video, reading lists, or whatever we have discussed. So I would like you to try using the remaining four weeks. Now remember, we do not want to do it beyond the last day of the semester because basically after you've done the learning contract number three, what you have to do is complete it. But what you now have to do until the end of the semester, which is the 25th of this month, or you want to say at one more day, which is the main class day, the 27th of this month, it's you try to put together what you did in the past, including the work you submitted in the free learning contracts, including the work you did on your own in your personal journal or whatever you put it. You try to go back, you try to go back. First, identify some topic of interest that makes you curious, makes you want to find more, okay? You put it on a piece of paper or you put it on the journals here, okay, you still have the journals. And then you go back to the work you did and see if you could single out some artifacts of the work you did, okay? These work are related to those topics that you identify, okay? And ask yourself, if I were, if I were to tell people what I understand by those topics with what I did here, how can I put them together nicely? Okay? How can I put them together nicely? Should I draw a picture? Should I connect this with different stories that I can find on the internet? Should I write something of my own and stories to tell people? Or lessons learned? Should I create a PowerPoint with a few slides to tell people what I believe are important? Should I create a digital story on top of the PowerPoint which will tell people what I believe are important? Should I include some discussion detail which is already available on the forum? Should I record a conversations between a friend and I talking about this topic? whatever you believe are important, okay? And then, you try to consider, you have a basket here, the basket is your learning portfolio, and whatever you did, you put it in your basket, okay? And then finally, you go back to the portfolio space here, you use the wiki basic construct pages concept, you try to construct your story of learning in information security and privacy with a number of the topics you did and with some of the artifacts you produced. Remember, the most important thing is with some paragraphs of refractions. You always want you to tell the stories after you have thought through them. These paragraphs of refractions should not be long, okay? but it has to be concise. Okay, concise means we already have something which we can taste about, okay? So I would recommend that after you have submitted your learning contract number three by the end of this weekend, okay, you spend some time to think about what I invite you to do in this learning portfolio. Remember, I did not say what it's 
important. I did not say what is the required item. You have to design based on your experience of this course. And I did not say how many. I just said you try to produce something that you believe are important. Okay? And at the end of that, you must create your portfolio to tell people by using the wiki here. This is the wiki of the personal e-portfolio space to create that. Okay? And according to our to our syllabus, I will give you 30 points, something like this, on that. Alright? So do you see what you're going to do? Alright. So the question is, how much time do you need in order to identify your topics of interest? Okay? Now you have to look back to your first learning contract. You have to look back to your second learning contract. And you have to look back to your first learning contract. And remember, if you forget what you should have gone through, okay, you need to go back to week number one, day number one to go to course review. Alright? The principally speaking, we have singled out these questions for you in the first 10 weeks. Now remember, when you do the first learning contract, second learning contract, or even the third learning contract, what is required of you is just you need to do one question, remember? Not all. So you have a lot of room for choices indeed to tell your learning portfolio story. Okay? So you have a lot of choices. So it's a kind of exercise which will give you a lot of freedom to choose. And once you've chosen your topic, you need to identify something you want to put under that topic to represent the learning for that. And my recommendation, of course, is to look at things like this. You've done some journals, you've done some discussions, you've done a report, you've done the blog in the first learning contract, something similar in the second learning contract, exactly something the same in the third learning contract. Saving for, you also need to do a PowerPoint here, you also need to do a digital story here, which is the voice over PowerPoint. And then, basically, something like this. And of course, as I said, you might want to include some conversational voice record with other people. You might go to interview your friends, okay, for a particular topic, but listen to them. And then you can put the voice record uh, of the interview of your friend, take the small part of them, the response in your learning portfolio. It's really up to you, okay? So, the most important thing is, we do not want to go back to the traditional a comprehensive exam format. We do not need exam. But we want you to select some topic. Okay? At a minimum one topic. Okay? At a minimum one topic. Which you can actually develop some ideas of your own. Okay? So now may I just stop here and then show you the meanings of portfolio from the perspective of a student at City University in Hong Kong. Okay? Because what they have to do before they graduate at the City University of Hong Kong, they really have to create portfolios to, as one important thing they have to do before they graduate, but not here in the account. So let's go to the essentials. Okay? Let's say it's right here. I think this one will be good. Personal repository or archive. 
In an e-portfolio, you can showcase your best work to present evidence of your expertise and accomplishments to a specific audience, such as an employer or teacher. An e-portfolio can also be a learning and management tool to help you organize your goals and activities and to encourage deep learning through collaboration and reflection. No wonder the other candidates were so confident and competent. Now Emily realized that her CV and covering letter were really not sufficient. Emily decided to create her own e-portfolio, but confronted by piles of work and loads of information she wanted to present, Emily was lost. How could she deal with all of this in one single e-portfolio? You may have the same question as Emily did. Here are four steps you can follow to organize your work and information. Step 1. Start collecting the footprints of your life, which can be the work you have done or thought written down. The collection becomes your personal database. Step 2. Spend some time thinking about who you are and what you want to be. Identify your goals, they can be short term or long term, and come up with action plans. Step 3. Follow your plans. In the meantime, reflect on your performance and thinking when carrying the plans out. Step 4. Organize your work and reflection and put them in your database. Emily had been collecting her work and reflecting on her experiences during her time at Sydney. When looking for a job, Emily selected relevant information from the pool and created her employment e-portfolios. She could therefore talk more fluently about her achievements and provide more concrete examples of her expertise to impress potential employers. Now Emily is a manager in her company, and she continues to use an e-portfolio to manage her professional development and present her achievements. So you know something about what, what students at Universal Hong Kong is doing. Um, of that verse is basically um, this is an important aspect of your work as a college student that in the past um, sorry, so what exactly is an e-portfolio? we'll talk about this in a minute uh, basically in the past uh, we do not care about this we just say oh you come to this course you can meet the requirements of the course then there's the instructor you have to make sure you complete homework, you, you finish the test, you finish the project, and find an exam, get your grade, and that's it. But I think the most important thing is in GE, uh, as, as an instructor that I received from the student management, we need to inform students. It's not so much about the content they are learning here is important, it's how they keep track of the process of the learning. And so we need to inform them if they want to be if looking for a job or getting admitted to graduate school, they need to get start doing this as soon as possible. In particular, in this GE course, we start from freshman. So, now look at that. If from year one, you start building the uh, collections of the artifacts of the learning course by course, at the end of year one, you have so many courses, and you can do at least some portions of the courses, you have a lot of the artifacts to accumulate. And then you can manage to build up your profile for year one using the artifact you constructed here. And then those artifacts represent the product of the hard work, the product of the learning in a particular course. So whenever you are asked the question, what have you learned here or there or there? Well, not only students today, uh, particularly in Hong Kong City Europe, are now studying in Hong Kong, the true, but in Hong Kong education, Institute of Education did it for four years, they use the school provided portfolio. And here is my personal e-portfolio provided at my university, and we use them to keep track of our learning. If you ask me what I've learned, I can show you this is my summary of year one. If you want to know why and what we have learned, I can show you this is my course-based portfolio. And in this course, this is what I've learned. And people were very much impressed uh, about things like this. So in Hong Kong, uh, most of the company, particularly the international companies, would like to 
see students walk into an interview room with links to them, because they do not need to bring in anything. They have a computer to them. Like here is a computer where you can access the whole portfolio, just access them and give us to take a look at. Okay? We seldom look at the resume today, which is one piece of paper. Okay? So basically, that is the reason why we want to enhance your IL. You, as an individual student, must do something to put things together, connect things together, to integrate the learning based on the artifacts, which are the evidence for learning. Um, that's why I'm suggesting you need to do. And the second thing I would like to show here is typically, this is the trend, not just in Hong Kong, back to the Hong Kong part of the food step of Lumber Americans and the Britons. And so let me show you. Experience of Birmingham City University has shown that the benefits of e portfolios need to be clearly understood. Where a member of academic staff has designed learning activities that require the use of e portfolio, students really appreciate that. Where an e portfolio has been used as is there, 
get on with it if you want to. I don't think students see why they should do it, but I don't think students realise the value of it. And they're confused about why are we doing this, why aren't we using Facebook? This isn't Facebook. There is a need for an institutional people program. We integrate the need. We can close the loop on assessment. A student may develop their e-portfolio quite independently, but submit it as a new assignment, come into the new grade book, be marked, and all of that can be deleted and closed. With Facebook, how on earth can you do that? What do students think of the hierarchies? We assumed wrongly as it turned out that students would all be using things like Facebook and, and other social networking tools and let's pick up the quickly. Whereas the reality was that not all of them did, lots of them did, but not all of them did. They had to be quite responsible. And as soon as we realised that, we offered topic training, offered sessions, extra support for their students that needed it. It's becoming such an important part of learning in general terms. But I can't imagine looking at it in a few years in the future, it won't be embedded in every course at some level or some level. Not just about us as academics pushing content out. Much more interesting to see what students do and give back. Okay, you just are part of the story at the University of Birmingham in England. They uh, use Moodle and they also use Mahara. Now, I'm not here to tell you that you need to use Mahara. Uh, that is your book. What you need to do personally when you go back to your personal life down, particularly at Presidential College. But what you can find is this is for them, okay? If you build your course based portfolios here, you can easily download or forward your material to your Mahara by clicking a link. All right, because basically you have got uh, two systems connected and a unit versus the account. So what I'm trying to tell you uh, is uh, I, I would expect you to do something, study for if not this week, next week, or we still have up to April the 25th. So you have three more weeks to do that. And as I mentioned at the very beginning, I have given you some tips on the portfolio based things. They are actually, you can use the Google sign to do it. You can also use WordPress. Uh, I do not know when our school is going to give you WordPress account. I heard ICQ is going to give each student to design a Mahara a WordPress account, which is hosted by the university account. But I'm not so sure when, but I've given you the material here, all right? So uh, what you need to do is to come up with something uh, Related to your learning in this course, uh, I did not specify how many I left you design. Okay, but what I believe is important is um, you do not need to come up with many topics. Perhaps just like what one student did last semester, the topic is very simple: information security and privacy, which is the name of this course. And then to come up with two stories from the newspaper. Okay, and then. He wrote something about the story, personal learning about this, and uh, create a PowerPoint based on the story, and then record a voice. And that's it. All right. So um, I think it's really up to you. Now, if you were asked someday when you go for an interview or summer internship, or you did a course which is gender education, and I, I, I love the title of this course for information, security, and privacy, can you tell us? A little bit more about what you learned on the course. Uh, maybe this is a question. And then you use this question as the guideline to tell people what you learned on this course. You say what you can select from here, but tell a coherent story. Okay? Well, my advice is still trying to mature this. If you want to tell so many stories, somehow people got confused to tell a single story. But one story might lead to other story with a very interesting clue. So what? What then? How come people will ask questions like this? Okay? So that you are going to tell them this story. But we have given you a lot of stories. Uh, if you are soft of stories, 
make sure you let me know. Actually, I put a lot of stories there, including the very famous stories of Mark Zuckerberg, the creator of Facebook. Right? Have you ever seen Mark Zuckerberg sucks in the TV screen when he was asked questions on privacy and he's sweating? I've got a story in my head. And you can, tell, you can see that this guy, at the age of 19, he, he was speechless because he did some kind of policy in favor of anger among the people in the states. Now it's a little different again. Okay? You, you can tell stories about this. Okay? Uh, actually, I think it's a quick factor. I didn't, I didn't broadcast it in class because I didn't know how to get it. Okay. Yeah. Someone, 
they got well prepared pinpointing on the issues they created. And in the, in the specific context of Mark Zuckerberg, um, they pinpoint on a privacy issue. Okay? And it's very interesting. And uh, this is a short one, on 2 minutes and 17 seconds. I will give you a, a relatively true story of uh, industries with that's the real face people I Facebook, which tells the whole stories about this. Okay, now um, I'm just trying to tell you that in the other environments there, I've written a lot of stories like this, and I hope you understand um, the reasons why they are useful is because they will help you to discover more stories of your interest that in happen to be pinpointing the kinds of issue. Okay? Um, but information security is also discussed here. All right, let me give you back the time so that the two teams here can talk about this. If you have to continue with the learning contract number three, please feel free to do it. If you have a you can ask me. All right. So in the meantime, let me make sure that I'll give you the link.
If you want to create a presentation in Microsoft PowerPoint that will run online or includes audio throughout the entire presentation, you can record narration to accompany the PowerPoint file. First, when you're in normal view, select the thumbnail in the slides pane on the left for the slide in which you want the narration to begin. Then, click the slideshow tab in the top navigation. And in the setup group, click the button to record narration. PowerPoint will open a dialog box where you can adjust the levels and the quality of your recording. So first select the button to set the microphone level and specify the volume setting. Then click OK. Next, select the button to change quality and in the first drop down menu choose the quality for the recording. CD quality is the highest quality and telephone quality is the lowest. Of course, the higher the sound quality, the larger the file size. When you've made your selection, the attributes will change automatically and you can click OK. Now, down at the bottom of the dialog box, you can choose whether to link the narration recording to the presentation. Just check the box to link, and then browse to select the folder in which you want to save the file. If you don't link the narration, it's actually embedded into your presentation. So by linking it, you can keep your presentation file at a manageable size. You just need to remember to save the link narration file to the same folder as your presentation on your hard drive or external media. Now it's time to start recording. As soon as you click OK in the dialog box, the slide that you chose as the first slide for your narration will open in slideshow view. Just an FYI, if you choose a slide other than the first one in your presentation to record your narration, you'll get a little pop-up box asking if you want to start recording from that slide or from the first slide. You can just speak your narration into the microphone and the audio will be recorded with that slide. When you're done with the narration for that slide, click on the slide to advance to the next one. Wherever you start, you can just keep recording the narration and clicking on the slide to advance to the next slide at the appropriate time in your presentation. If you need to take a breather at any point, just right mouse click on the slide that you're in and select pause narration. Then when you're ready to get rolling again, just right mouse click again and select resume narration. Once you've recorded your whole presentation and you get to the black screen that tells you you're at the end of the slideshow, click on that screen to save your narration. The dialog box will also ask you whether you want to save the slide timings with your narration. When you select Save, your presentation will appear in slide sorter view with the timings displayed under each slide. If you choose Don't Save, PowerPoint will still save your recorded narration but not the timing, and you'll just go back to the first slide. You may want to turn off the timing if it doesn't benefit the presentation. For example, if you accidentally included long pauses between slides. Turning off the timing also gives the viewer the option to control the pacing. Now you can choose one of the buttons in the top navigation to run your slideshow from the beginning, or to select a slide and run it from that spot, so you can test the timings and the recorded narration. If you decide that you want to run the slideshow with the narration, but without the saved timings, Select the Slideshow tab from the top navigation, and in the Setup group, select Setup Slideshow. You'll see here in the dialog box, there's an option to advance slides manually instead of with the recorded timings. Depending on your audience, you can also choose the Show Type and Show Options here on the left. And when you're done making your selections, click OK. If it's OK, try this video. Steps which are probably okay? Now, this is only one of the numerous methods. Another method that is suggested, it's also here, um, let me see. There is another free software which is called Contagious Studio. Okay? You can download the software and use it in your computer free of charge in 30 days. How are you going to use it? Well, the way to use it is when you start recording, everything on your screen will be recorded, and then you speak to the microphone, it will be recorded, and you will stop, okay? But everything here, that there's a chance for you to say something wrong, then you have to do it from the very beginning. But the PowerPoint one is much better, because you can actually do for each slide, and then get a good things together, all right? Okay.
not allow me to see attendance of the day. I think 
the PowerPoint one is the is a very flexible scheme because what I try is if I produce the PPT first, okay, I produce ten PPT, okay, then if I'm the MC, I will make the MC's introductions. In this PowerPoint, we have fifteen slides of information. The first one is an introduction. The second, the third, the fourth, and who is going to be responsible for the second, the third, and fourth? And then you stop it and you try to save it because it will be the voice will record per slide. So when you when you save the file, okay, you can pass the file to the other persons, and the other persons can open up the file and do the recording again. According to this, it should be saved inside the PPT file. You can try it, you can try it first. But you must use perhaps the school's computer. Um, they don't have it here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so whatever you make, uh, one person to do it all. Is the best for you. I'm afraid if one person do it all, it may not be fair to other people. What do you mean? It's an extra time. Button you need to watch for. Record the slide so something like this. So try to 
Number 22, week number 11. All right.